All right, we are now on to our second to last body system. We're going to do respiratory system today, and then on Monday we'll do endocrine with a special focus on reproductive hormones. I think the last lesson you do, I think you guys are going to really, really like. Um, students seem to get very, very interested when I talk about this particular topic, and it is very controversial. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's a surprise. Um, so we're going to do the respiratory system. Um, I'm, it's actually pretty, it's not that long, and unlike cardiovascular and um, nervous system, there's not any special processes that we're going to focus on. So I thought the conduction of the heart can be kind of difficult, and definitely action potential is, is probably the most difficult thing that we will have gone over um, in this class. Respiratory is pretty straightforward. The function is to supply oxygen to the blood and to remove carbon dioxide because well, if you haven't taken cell bio, you haven't, you may not have gone over this, but there's this process that occurs in all of your cells in the mitochondria that's called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is going to involve the production of ATP, which is the energy. So anytime something happens in your body that requires energy, it's ATP that gets made from the food you eat. And I'm not going to go through that whole process because it is a very complicated process. But um, pretty much oxygen is involved in the um, process of forming ATP. So once oxygen comes in, it is used to make ATP. You then have the removal of carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide um, comes from the food that you eat. And then oxygen ends up being converted into water. So kind of interesting if you think of carbon dioxide used to be glucose. The hydrogens were used to form ATP, and then those hydrogens get stuck onto water. I don't want to get too far into that, but I do think it's kind of a cool process to look at it that way. Um, so these are all of the parts of the respiratory system. Of course, you have your lungs, then you have your bronchus or your bronchi, and then the trachea, larynx, nose, nostrils, oral cavity, pharynx, so when you go and you get a, a COVID test done, um, they stick a swab in and it goes like all the way back there. So it's called a nasopharynx swab. Um, and I hear it's just uncomfortable. Like it doesn't hurt. It burns a little bit. It makes your uh, eyes water, but it's not super uncomfortable. Um, I'm actually getting one done tomorrow just because my daughter's had a little, uh, a little cold. So um, I just want to be on the safe side, make sure it's not going on in our family. So we are quarantining right now. As you saw my son yesterday on the call, we're all at home. And then I'm going to get my test results back to see if it was in our house. But I will let you guys know how that nasopharynx test went. All right. And then you have the diaphragm. I want to point that out. That's the muscle at the bottom here that helps you expand your lungs. All right. So here is the anatomy, uh, the nose and the mouth filtered warmed humidified so air gets filtered warmed and humidified before it goes into your lungs if it did not then your lungs would dry out um, your nose and your mouth also contains mucus which traps bacteria and foreign debris and then there are cilia that sweeps mucus towards the throat and is digested by the stomach. So my daughter, who had this little, what I assume was just a minor cold this past weekend, but I do want to be careful, like I said, she came to me and she goes, I, she said something, and this is kind of gross, but it's still, it's a misconception that a lot of little kids think. They think if they suck their snot back into the back of their throat and they swallow it, that they're making themselves more sick, but it's actually the opposite. One of the reasons why you have the, um, it's almost like an automatic behavior to like, like sniff. I know that's kind of gross, but that's what we do. Um, it's an automatic behavior to do that, not only because it keeps it from coming out of your nose, but also we are designed and we have evolved to do that because if we suck it back into our throat and we swallow it, the acid in our stomach is actually going to degrade the bacteria. So that is actually a way that you are trying to get yourself well. So next time you do that, you remember you're helping yourself out. And so um, you can look right here, the nasal cavity, the nostrils, the oral cavity, and the pharynx is actually um, the back of your throat is considered the pharynx. So let me go, sorry, let me go back to that right here. So the pharynx is your throat. I just wanted you to see the picture. It is where food and air are going to first pass through. And then you also have clusters of lymphatic tissue 
um, which are going to make up your tonsils and some people have to get those removed. My daughter got hers removed last year. She was, uh, how old was she when she did it? She was four. I don't even remember how old my kids are anymore. There's too many of them. Anyways, she was four um, when she got her tonsils removed and it was a, such an easy process. Um, it took 24 hours and she was bouncing off the walls again. But I do know as you get older and if you're in your teens um, and you get your tonsils removed, it's it's supposed to be pretty, kind of a rough recovery. So um, I definitely feel for people who get that done. Um, the larynx contains the vocal cords. And the larynx have this covering and it's called the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is a little flap that covers the larynx when liquids and food are swallowed. So let's take a look at that real quick. So you have the larynx right here and you see the vocal cords are, are in the larynx, but you also see the larynx is connected to um, the trachea and the uh, bronchus, right? So the epiglottis is protecting the vocal cords, but the epiglottis is also protecting you from getting food and water um, down into your lungs. So really important, listen up. Anytime someone gets alcohol poisoning, and that, and you never know how many drinks it takes. I mean, obviously it takes a lot. But if someone has alcohol poisoning, they pass out. You always have to roll them on their side. And the reason you roll them on their side is because if they're on their back and they vomit, alcohol will keep, alcohol causes the epiglottis to come open. And so if they vomit when their epiglottis is open, vomit will get down into the lungs and that's called aspiration. And vomit in the lungs is a great breeding ground for, um, for infection. And so uh, that could lead to pneumonia. So um, hopefully you would never be in a situation where you had a friend do that, but I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning um, that if alcohol poisoning can lead to problems like that. Um, trachea, your trachea is your windpipe. It's connected to the larynx. It's made up of cartilage. And then you have your uh, bronchi and your bronchioles. So the bronchi are the big branches and the bronchioles are the small branches. And then within your lungs, you have alve alveoli, which are air sacs that are responsible for the gas exchange. All right, so hopefully you got all of those written down. So all the parts, the anatomy of it all. All right, so pause it if you don't have it all written down because I'm moving on. Oh Lord, okay. This is just one of those pictures I wanted to show you, kind of like I showed you with the picture of the brain. And I said, we're just scratching the surface in some anatomy courses. Um, if you are going into ear, nose, and throat medicine, this is a chart that you, or this is a diagram that you would have to know. Um, my mom was a professor uh, for audiology and speech pathology, and she actually taught anatomy at the University of Houston. And she made them memorize I mean, this is not the only one she had them memorize. Sorry, I keep flipping it. Um, she had them memorize lots of charts like this. Um, so anyways, you don't have to do that. I just wanted to show you how bad it could be so that you would appreciate what we were doing. All right, um, the pharynx is then broken down into nasopharynx. So um, this is uh, where that swab goes whenever you get the COVID test. God, I'm scared. Um, the oropharynx. Um, by the time I talk to you guys during Zoom, though, I will have had it done because my appointment's at 930. I don't think I have it, but I, I have to be a, a responsible citizen. And if someone in my house was sick and the testing's available, I have to get it. Anyways, enough about me. Um, so the oropharynx is where your mouth and your throat and the pharynx, the throat meets. And then laryngopharynx is uh, where you would see that, that deeper level where you're um, about to get to the vocal cords. So, all right. Um, this is where the vocal cords are and what they look like. These are all the different parts of the vocal cords. So here's the base of the tongue. There's your epiglottis, vestibular fold, the vocal fold, the glottis, um, the inner lining of the trachea. And so um, a lot of uh, what goes into talking and making noise would be the air passing by the vocal cords. And I think what I want to do for Monday is I'd like to find a video where they've actually introduced a, a camera into someone's vocal cords because I, I would actually like to show you a video of it. Um, I am not a, a real expert on vocal cords. It's nothing that I ever really learned about in um, 
in my experience working in hospitals or in pharmacy, um, but this is something that if you were going into speech pathology and audiology, well, mostly speech pathology, this is something that you would want to learn a lot about. My mom, So I said my mom was a professor at University of Houston, but she was also a clinical speech pathologist and audiologist, and she just thought that was the best job ever. It's something that students don't typically think of as a future career, but they can make a really good living. They are in really high demand. Um, the only thing is you work with little kids and you work with the elderly. So if you got an issue with either one of those, that's not the career for you. You've got to have a lot of patience to do it. But great career. She wanted me to go into that, but um, I decided to be a teacher after. Well, anyways, um, so the lungs, um, are going to be broken up into lobes, superior lobe. So we see those these words, superior and inferior, um, superior, middle, inferior, um, superior, um, another um, inferior lobe. So it looks like you have three lobes on the right, two lobes on the left. Um, you have your primary bronchus here. Um, you have your secondary bronchus, which comes out here, and then it branches out um, into a bunch of different little bronchioles. That's really all I want you to see. The question does come up, why does the right lung have three lobes and the left only has two? And um, the, really the, the reason that I can think of is um, on the left side, there does have to be a space to accommodate the heart since we know that the heart leans left. Um, and then also the right is going to, it's going to be a little bit wider and shorter because the liver is going to be underneath it. So it really just has to do with um, what organs are around it. But I'm not, you know, I, I don't really know what exactly why three and two. I think it just some way, somehow that's just how it came to be because of the arrangement of the or other organs around it. So in case you were wondering. Right now we're going to take it a little bit more into a microscopic view of the alveoli. So now we're inside of the lungs um, at the very, very end of the um, bronchioles. So at the very end of the bronchioles, those branches, those almost like tree-like branches that you saw, um, you have these little almost like popcorn looking things called the alveoli. And the alveoli are going to be surrounded by a lot of little teeny tiny blood vessels called capillaries. And so you have oxygen poor blood coming in from the heart. And then within the, these capillaries, this is where the diffusion of oxygen is going to go from the lung into the blood. And then the blood is going to go back up to the heart and get pumped out to the rest of the body. All right, and this slide right here is just showing you another view. It's showing you a side view of the alveoli, and then this is just showing you like a cross section of it. Um, once again, they're just little tiny sacs that are bunched together to look almost like a, a piece of popcorn. Um, the one thing I want to point out in this slide is there's just a lot going on in this slide. I want to point out alveolar pores. The pores are going to be little holes between the sacs that connect each sac together. And what that does is that's going to reduce intra-alveolar pressure. And so it kind of equalizes the pressure because gases can kind of get shared among them. So then you don't have to worry about any of these little, little sacs popping. So that's the only thing I wanted to point out about that. Okay, um, I need to kind of Try to change my view here. You guys have this picture on your paper. Let me look at the paper. Yeah, you have this picture on your paper. I'm sorry it's cut off a little bit. Um, so I'll just kind of move it up. Keep messing up. I'm telling you. You know, I would edit out all my mistakes, but um, I was talking to Mr. Molina the other day, and he said that the experts say that when you're doing these live lectures that you should make mistakes. For some reason, it helps you like be um, appear more human. Anyways, I'll shut up. All right, so the first step, inhale air. Air goes into the alveolar spaces. Oxygen gets diffused uh, into the capillaries. And then the oxygenated blood is going to go through the pulmonary vein to the heart. And then from the heart, through the aorta, the oxygen-rich blood is going to get pumped to the rest of the body through the systemic arteries. Then there's another set of capillaries, and those capillaries are going to um, be really, really tiny, and they're going to involve the diffusion of oxygen into body tissue, and then the diffusion of used, I, I call it used carbon dioxide, 
um, it's, yeah, it, it's carbon dioxide that actually didn't, it's left over. Carbon dioxide is what is left over from your food, kind of like I said earlier. And whenever I teach uh, cellular respiration, I like to point that out. Carbon dioxide is just glucose that was broken apart and had all of its hydrogens plucked off of it. Anyway, so that's going to diffuse back into the, um, to the capillaries. And then your oxygen poor blood is now going to bring back carbon dioxide then that carbon dioxide oxygen poor blood is going to go back to the lungs and then you are going to breathe out carbon dioxide so i love that i think i'm actually going to start incorporating this picture into um into my cellular respiration so if you're taking cell bio with me you're about to see this picture again i think it just gives a lot of relevance to um, cellular respiration and and where the oxygen comes in and where the carbon dioxide goes out i love this it completes the picture so well um so um it is, I'm just thinking what else I want to say about this. Um, it is dangerous to have too much carbon dioxide in the bloodstream because when carbon dioxide and water are mixed together, you end up with a chemical called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid, obviously being an acid, causes pH to go down. And the blood has to have a perfect pH of about 7.35. So if it becomes too acidic, then that person is in danger. Um, if you don't have enough carbon dioxide, there's not enough carbonic acid, so pH goes up too high. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the danger of that in just a minute when a person has a panic attack and they have too much carbon dioxide. But I do have a slide for that, so I'm going to wait a second. All right, mechanics of breathing. Inspiration is airflow into the lungs. Expiration is air leaving the lungs. That's easy. Um, the diaphragm is the muscle that's dome shaped. Um, that separates the thoracic and the abdominal cavities and it is going to um, help pull the ribs to um, it's going to elevate the rib cage and help with the inspiratory muscles and i'm pretty sure i have i have a nice um, diagram here in just a little while and i'm going to go over these muscles so you have your diaphragm which is on the bottom you have your uh, external intercostals which help pull the ribs and then you have your internal intercostals that help depress the ribs so uh, external and this is for inspiration and this one's for expiration so hopefully y'all got that down so two mechanics inhale exhale diaphragm is going to help with both external intercostals is going to pull the ribs out so you can inhale internal intercostals are going to depress the rib cage so you can exhale so there's muscles involved in both of those. So diaphragm contracts and flattens for inspiration. External intercostals lift the ribs. Lungs stretch. Air pressure inside of the lungs decreases. Air is sucked into the lungs. So if you increase the volume of the lungs, pressure decreases, causing more air to go in so that the uh, pressure can be equalized. All right, during expiration, your inspiratory muscles relax, the rib cage descends, the lungs recoil, gases are forced out because as your lungs, um, as you push your lungs closed, you're decreasing volume, which increases pressure, so then air has to go out. So there's a lot involved with pressure. Um, so right here, this is just showing you diaphragm goes down, um, these, the muscles that are, um, that your intercostal muscles, like we said right here, lift the rib cage and it expands, decreasing pressure, pressure so air gets to go in. Then right here, your diaphragm moves up. Those intercostal muscles are gonna go down. That increases pressure, causing air to move out. I don't know what that is, but uh, if we need to watch that, I will show it during a Zoom. I don't wanna go over my time for this lecture. Um, but I will show that in the Zoom. And there was one other thing. I'll, find, I'll figure that out in a little while. All right, so respiratory capacity is what your lab is actually on. I think this is a really cool lab. Um, you are going to make a spirometer, and you are going to be testing all of these different things. So I'll need to go over what each one of these numbers means. Um, you have your tidal volume. Um, you have your reserve you have your expiratory and your reserve, you have a residual volume, and then you have your total lung capacity and your vital capacity. Now, I hope that you can find a jug that will at least, gosh, how much does a, a um, milk jug hold? 
Okay, so I looked it up and it sounds, it looks like a milk jug holds 3,800 milliliters. If you can find something bigger than a milk jug, that would be really awesome, especially um, if you are in athletics um, or something like that and you think that you probably um, have a little bit higher vital capacity than, than someone else. Or you can just try the milk jug and just blow all the air out of it. Um, so I want to go over some terms related to respiratory capacity, and this can be a little bit confusing. So vital capacity is the total exchangeable air, the total amount of air that you can possibly breathe in and then breathe out, really, really making a concentrated effort, all right? So you're adding everything. Together. I want to make sure I explain this right. So you're wanting to add everything together. Vital capacity is everything, the whole volume. All right. So these, this means tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume. All right. Tidal volume is the normal amount of air that you are breathing. So right now, as you're watching this video, the amount of air that you're breathing in and out that you are not consciously thinking about. That is your tidal volume. So I want you to remember that. Tidal volume is if I am not actually making any effort, I'm just breathing like my brainstem is telling me to, that's my tidal volume and it should be about 500 milliliters. Okay. Your inspiratory, inspiratory reserve volume is the forced air in when you are actually trying. So inspiratory reserve is total amount I can suck in minus what I would have normally been breathing anyways. Okay, so I take the total amount I would suck in and I subtract what the tidal volume would have been and that's my inspiratory reserve, all right? Expiratory reserve is the total amount I would breathe out minus what I normally would have been breathing out anyway, sitting comfortably, okay? And then residual volume is any air still left in the lungs because there's you're never gonna get all of it out or your lungs could like possibly collapse <laughs> without having anything in there. And so we don't really take residual volume that much into consideration because it's just kind of sitting there and it's just like, yeah, I'm here, I'm just here to keep things open and make sure the air can still come in and that the lungs don't like stick together or anything like that. What's important is the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve and expiratory reserve. Your lab has some different terms and I am gonna go over those in detail in the Zoom. So if you are watching this and you're an early bird, um, I will go in over it detail in the Zoom or actually I lie. I'm gonna explain it at the end of this video for those of you that like to get your work done in the morning because I don't wanna mess up your workflow. So just stick around at the end of the lecture and I'll uh, explain the lab in, in detail. All right, so residual volume is going to allow gas exchange to continue between breaths. So it's allowing gas exchange to keep going. And like I had said, it keeps your lungs having a little bit of air in there so that they don't like collapse or anything. And then I will play this video during our Zoom call if I need to, or actually, let me just try it now. Let me just try it now. How much time did I allot for this? You know what it feels like. Oh, it's only one You've minute. You've been studying hard in med you school. You can watch it. But it's your classmate who keeps getting high scores. Actually, the ad was one minute. Oh, no. <laughs> we are not watching that. <laughs> so this is understanding spirometry. We're going to look at spirometry and look at the differences between normal, obstructive pulmonary disease, and also restrictive lung disease. It is a good idea to recap uh, the lung volumes and lung capacities before looking into this video. So one way to monitor lung function is by using a lung function test, such as a spirometry. If we breathe in and out normally in this lung volume measuring device, we can see our tidal volume, which is typically 500 mils or 0.5 liters. The graph here. I'll have to stop it early. I just want to get let it get as much possible and, and then I'll stop it. This is the lung volume. So going up the y axis is inspiration. The lung volume will increase when we inspire air in. And going down the y-axis is expiration. The lung volume will decrease when we breathe out, obviously. So now imagine taking a maximal deep breath in. This is the inspiratory reserve volume, also known as IRV. 
And now imagine taking a normal breath or normal breaths and then having a maximal expiration. This is your expiratory reserve volume or ERV. And the air remaining in your lungs after the maximal expiration is the residual volume or RV. You just always have that there. Okay. I think he uh, sufficiently explained what I just went over and he used a graph to do it. Um, so if you need that video, uh, you can take a picture of it and type that in, but I think I'm just going to go on um, without that. Um, the spirometer is going to be a device um, that's used to test your vital capacity and um, just your lung capacity in general. And so what you're going to do is you're going to make a homemade one in your lab. Um, and so your lab today is to make a spirometer to measure your own lung capacity and that of a, I think I have that of a family member. Yes, I put two tubes in your bucket. So a family member you're going to compare kind of like you did with the reaction test. And I'm going to go over that at the end of the lecture and during Zoom. Okay, so let's just talk about um, gas transport. Okay. Gas transport involves um, oxygen that is attached to hemoglobin, hemoglobin molecules inside of red blood cells to um, be diffused across capillaries and be dropped off at uh, certain you know, body parts, muscles, glands, um, whatever it is that needs to make ATP, which is pretty much all cells. So oxygen is going to be delivered all over the body. You have a protein called hemoglobin with um, iron an iron-containing substance called heme, and what oxygen does is it attaches to heme, and one hemoglobin is going to bind four oxygen molecules. So one hemoglobin for four oxygen molecules. So go ahead and make sure you write that down. One hemoglobin binds four oxygen molecules. All right. Um, so carbon dioxide, let's talk about carbon dioxide for a minute. Um, this is just a really complicated picture that shows you how carbon dioxide can diffuse into a red blood cell and how it gets stored on the red blood cell and then taken to the lungs to get dropped off to get exhaled. Um, carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate. Um, and it's just a form, I guess I want to find where bicarbonate is. So when it diffuses into the red blood cell, it goes through a series of changes and it dissociates into hydrogen. And then this is bicarbonate right here. I couldn't see it earlier. So this is bicarbonate. So it just gets, so basically carbon dioxide is going to be transported by red blood cells bound to hemoglobin. And then some of it is going to get dissolved in the plasma. So really all you need to know from this slide is carbon dioxide is going to get transported back to the lungs and it's going to get exhaled. All right, the control of respiration, um, the control center, and I, I need you guys to write this in, please write this in. Um, the control center of respiration is going to span the pons and the medulla. In your lecture yesterday, I only mentioned the pons, but some of that respiration control is going to span into the medulla. So write the pons down with it. Um, respiration is going to respond to pH changes in the blood. So like I had said before, carbon dioxide mi mixed with water is going to form carbonic acid and it's going to lower pH. So if pH gets too low, your respiration or your exhalation rate is going to increase. If your um, pH gets too high, it's going to slow down the exhaling of carbon dioxide. And you have sensors um, in your arteries um, and in your blood vessels that are going to sense oxygen content, but it will also sense pH and will send signals to the brain to control breathing rate. It's actually pretty cool how that works. And so that leads me to um, the example of panic attacks and breathing. Um, so what happens when a person has panic attacks is instead of filling their lungs with full, complete breaths, they'll take really quick and short, shallow breaths. And so this is known as hyperventilation. And this overbreathing is going to cause um, carbon dioxide levels in the blood to decrease. So they're breathing too much carbon dioxide out. And so if carbon dioxide levels in the blood decrease, that's going to make pH go up because there's not as much carbonic acid. And so what they'll, you'll do is you'll put a bag over your face and you'll breathe carbon dioxide out, but then you're going to breathe it right back in. That makes you hyperventilate. Um, a reduction in carbon dioxide can cause even further symptoms. So having a panic attack could um, cause things like uh, tingling and numbness, chest pain, and dry mouth. And what that will do is it will exacerbate the panic attack even more. 
um, to where you then think you're dying. Um, so those are not fun at all. People have gone to the ER with uh, what they believe to be a heart attack when it was just a panic attack. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is opioid overdose, which is kind of a big deal right now. I don't know if you guys were following the um, issue with Narcan and all pharmacists um, having a prescription for Narcan or them, um, not a prescription, all pharmacists having Narcan behind the counter um, or um, a patient being able to buy Narcan just over the counter without a prescription. Um, a opioid or overdose will involve something like oxycodone, hydrocodone, or heroin. Um, there's other, it's not, what other? Codeine, I guess. Codeine's kind of weak though. Um, it's mostly going to be your oxycodone and your uh, morphine and, um, cause there's so many, and heroin that are going to cause overdose. And why pharmacists wanted them is because um, a lot of times patients will come in and they'll get their prescription refilled and they're an addict and they will have been without the prescription for a while and their tolerance level will go down and then they'll take the same dose that they were taking before. And with their tolerance level having gone down, they'll actually have a stronger effect. And so there are overdoses that happen a lot in the pharmacy bathrooms. I never saw one, thank goodness. Um, but I did have a lot of people that were like fiending for their um, opioid come into the pharmacy and beg me to fill it for them. And I'm just like, I can't, it's not legal. So if a person overdoses um, with opioids, like morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, heroin, uh, fentanyl, um, I'm trying to think of all of them. Um, what it does, the opioid is going to bind to receptors in the brainstem and is going to slow down breathing to a dangerous level where the body's not getting enough oxygen. I have personal experience with something related to this. Now, not, nothing that has to do with heroin. I hope you guys like my little personal stories. I love telling my personal stories. When I had my son, um, and even when I had my daughters, I had a C-section and um, that's what, I mean, they cut you open. Like it hurts so bad. And you're awake when they do it. They numb you with a, an epidural. And so you can't feel it while they're doing it. But man, when that epidural wears off, holy, that is so painful. So I have an IV, at least my first two days after having a C-section, I have an IV of morphine um, and I have like a little button that I push. And now if you push the button too much, it'll stop giving you doses, but you push a button and it, and it administers um, IV um, narcotics to you. Um, and so my deal was I would um, click the button and then I would lay there and I swear to you, you just don't feel like breathing. Um, it's the weirdest feeling. You're so comfortable and you're just laying there and, and it's not hurting anymore. And so the nurses would come in and throughout the day, they would yell at me all day. You need to breathe. You need. So they'd have to come in, sit me up and they'd have to make me force myself to breathe because the automatic breathing was blocked by the opioid. So kind of scary, but they had a sensor, like an oxygen sensor on my finger and it would constantly start beeping because I would just not feel like breathing. It was a really weird feeling. So, um, a person that overdoses on an opioid will just be laying there and they just don't have the urge to breathe and they just die <laughs> from that and, it, and it's tragic and so that's why Narcan, having Narcan handy is something that people should have and, and people will argue by saying, well, they just shouldn't be overdosing on heroin in the first place. Well, you know, um, it has pretty much pretty good medical research to show that, that addiction isn't really like a choice choice. Um, it, it is something that it is a brain disease, but we won't get into that. Actually, we will talk about that in our Zoom because we um, talked about um, illicit drugs in mouse parties. So I do want to talk a little bit about addiction. Um, I am going to go over a little bit, 35 minutes, but I want to talk quickly about chronic obstruction pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. It is a group of lung diseases that lead to the block of airflow and makes breathing difficult. Um, it can be caused by emphysema, smoking. Um, emphysema is the, the term used um, for the loss of elasticity of lung tissue. And then chronic, chronic bronchitis is inflammation and excess mucus, making it very difficult for you to breathe and for oxygen to um, diffuse across the uh, al alveoli. Or, uh, yeah, alveoli or alveolar space. Um, a person that is uh, most prone to having COPD is someone who smokes. Um, and they have a history of smoking, usually is how they'll present. And they'll present with labored breathing, wheezing, shortness of breath, 
coughing, frequent pulmonary infections, frequent um, bronchitis, bacterial infections, uh, viral infections that they just can't seem to get rid of, or viral infections that'll turn into bacterial infections, and then they'll present hypoxic. Hypoxic means um, not enough oxygen delivery, and so their skin will look kind of blue, and then they'll put that thing on their finger and it'll start beeping that they don't have enough um, oxygen. So they're, they call it O2 sats, so their O2 sats will be too low. And so this is what it looks like, a healthy bronchitis, or a help, sorry, not a healthy bronchitis, <laughs> a, a healthy bronchi, um, and then uh, chronic bronchitis is where the bronchi are going to be inflamed with excess mucus. So you can see that, the, that it's narrowed, the tube is narrowed. And then with emphysema is where the alveoli, the ends of the bronchi um, or the bronchus are going to break down and um, cause them to not work as well. So treatment for COPD would be bronchodilators. Um, those are medications that come in the form of an inhaler. And what they'll do is they'll relax the muscles around the airway, um, helping to relieve cough and shortness of breath and just making it so that the amount of air that can get in is it's easier to get enough air in. So it makes me breathe to even talk about it. So this will be like your albuterol. And anytime you have probably had a um, bronchitis, bronchitis infection or a, a cough, you've probably got an inhaler. Um, it'll be um, the uh, generic form will be called um, albuterol, although there's a oh, pro air. Pro air is the same thing as albuterol. Um, and so this can really help with uh, relieving um, the the you know, being able to, not being able to breathe. Sorry, I just got a, an email from Mr. Spicer and it distracted me. It can help you be able to breathe better and relieve coughing and shortness of breath. Um, the other thing that you can get is an inhaled corticosteroid. So a corticosteroid, and an, an example would be like Flonase, also known as fluticasone. So if you ever use Flonase for your nose, that's a steroid that's going to reduce inflammation, is going to reduce an overactive immune system in that area. Flonase also comes as an inhaler. So um, it's a steroid that will reduce inflammation and prevent an overactive immune response in the lungs. So... So that is COPD. Um, a person with COPD is usually going to end up with an oxygen tank. And um, I will tell you another story. I'm going over time, but I'm telling some good stories today. I think maybe you may not like them, but I like telling them. So um, you can just fast forward if you want to. But I'm going to tell this story because it's crazy. I went to my um, OBGYN. This was when I was pregnant. And all my crazy stories happened when I was pregnant um, I, with my twins. And um, I looked out the window and the nurse was with me. And in the parking lot, a car had exploded. And there was, um, and, and I know this is disturbing, but there is a body um, on the ground and they had already covered up the body. Um, but what had happened was a man with COPD, he was in his 70s. And he um, had an oxygen tank. And the reason he had COPD and emphysema in the first place um, was because he was a smoker. And when you are carrying an oxygen tank and you light a cigarette, you are, co you are likely going to cause something very crazy to happen because those oxygen tanks are highly flammable. And he was sitting in his car with his wife and he had his oxygen tank and he lit his cigarette and the car exploded and, and his wife passed away. Um, very, very sad. And he was life flighted. So um, smoking and, and you can just don't get me started on addiction because I'll just go down a path with talking about addiction. I, um, I worked in the VA with addicts and, and I have a very, very strong feelings about addiction. But that just goes to show you how strong addiction is knowing that you could potentially blow up your car, but still not being able to not light that cigarette and get that nicotine fix. It is um, intense. The, the cravings that they have are intense, and that's just with cigarettes. So you can imagine what something like um, heroin or methamphetamine can do to a person um, and do to their brain. All right, so I'm off of that. <laughs> if you want to talk further about that, I would love to. Um, the last uh, disorder is asthma. Asthma is similar to COPD, um, but it occurs in younger people and it's not a result. It's usually, it's not a result of smoking and it, it will show up in, um, in children. Um, and in, usually it can go on for the rest of a person's life, or sometimes it can actually resolve itself in adulthood. And what this is, is an overactive immune response in the lungs and, and can't be explained. I mean, you can't blame them because they didn't smoke and it's just allergens. They're just highly allergic. So just like you get like a stuffy nose or a runny nose when there's um, 
you know, cedar or pollen. This person, they don't only have um, symptoms in their nose, they have symptoms in their lungs and pretty severe symptoms. So it's kind of the same thing in that the, the bronchial tubes are going to swell, get filled with mucus. So it's almost like they have COPD, but at a really young age. Um, and usually though, it's not quite as severe. So a person with asthma is not going to need an oxygen tank, um, but they will be treated with the same drugs, bronchodilers like albuterol or Pro-Air or inhaled corticosteroids like Flonase. And there's a slew of other inhalers, but I'm just mentioning two that you might be, two names that you might actually be familiar with. All right, so that is the respiratory system. Right now, I want to go into a discussion about the lab for those that just want to get a head start on it. Um, and if this will also serve a purpose, if you did not understand what I was talking about in the Zoom and you're watching this lecture after our Zoom, um, I want to be sure that I um, am able to explain this once again for you. All right, so sorry for the little pause there. I was trying to bring the document up. Um, so this is the spirometry lab. This is what you're going to need, um, some masking tape, a marking pen. Um, you don't really need a funnel. You can put water in a jug without a funnel. That's being a little extra. Um, food coloring, I actually bolded everything that was absolutely necessary. So if it's in bold, you absolutely need it. Um, and I think after you watch the video, um, you'll really get a sense for um, how it's supposed to go. So I'm going to let you guys watch this video, um, but I do want to explain what each one of these things mean. Um, and so the video will have you um, take a jug and you will mark it every 250 milliliters. And remember, a milk jug is going to have 3,800. Some of you, if depending on your total vital capacity, you may blow all the water out of it and we won't really have your number, but you will just have to say greater than 3,800. Um, and so you mark it every 250 mils, you fill it with colored water, and then you put it upside down in a tub that also has water. Then you stick the tube into the opening, and then you're going to blow air into it. Now, you can't just blow air in and then write something down. You have to be very um, intentional about how you're blowing the air in so that we get accurate numbers. All right, so let's go through each one of these. Tidal air. So tidal air is just a normal breath in and not even, don't even try. Like how deeply are you breathing just sitting here listening to me talk? That's your tidal air. So don't breathe in anymore. Don't make any more of an effort than you normally do, which is hard because you're thinking about it and you're like, wait, is that more than I normally do? Just do your best with that. But tidal air, you're going to breathe in what you normally breathe in and then breathe out what you normally breathe out. Don't push. Okay, because you're going to see in a minute why I mean that. If you push, what you're doing is you're adding your reserve air in, and that's not what we're trying to do. All we want is tidal air. And so remember um, in the lecture, it said tidal air is about 500 mils, um, but yours may not be that exact. So don't write down 500 and then not do it. Just please do it just so we can see. Um, so just normal breath in, what you normally breathe out, you will not get all the air out because you don't normally do that. All right. Then you write down your number and you do your trial two times and then you do uh, another person two times, okay? Because uh, they'll have their own tube. I um, would just recommend do your trials first, then they do their trials. Don't alternate back and forth because you never know, I don't know, with what, everything going on, we wanna be really sanitary. So um, you have two tubes for each of you, um, one tube for each of you to use, so two tubes total, but just, do your, all of your trials first and then theirs. Anyways, I'm sure you knew that without me saying it. And it's none of my business, really. If that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. It's not that big of a deal. Um, so that's normal breath in, normal breath out. Then you refill it. Normal breath in, normal breath out. Record how much you um, were able to displace. So how much water were you able to displace with your air? All right. The next one. Normal breath in, normal breath out keep pushing as far as you can, okay? So reserve air is going to be whatever you got here subtracted from normal breath in, normal breath out, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, and then that extra amount is what's gonna go there. Hopefully that made sense. All right, complement air. Complement air is not going to be normal breath in, 
It's going to be as big of a breath in as you can possibly take and then blow all the way through tidal air, through reserve air, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. So you can see this complement air is going to incorporate tidal and reserve, but then when you subtract, you're going to get the extra air that you took in in order to breathe it out. I hope that made sense. I'm still trying to find a good visual for this. Um, I would say if you're having trouble with it, then let me know. And then when you add all three of these together, you get your total vital capacity. So this is going to involve some subtracting, right? Tidal air, no subtracting. Breathe in, breathe out normal. Reserve air, breathe in normal, breathe out normal, but keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Subtract that from tidal air to get your reserve. Complement, breathe in, fill your lungs as much as you possibly can, blow out through tidal, through reserve, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Subtract your total amount from these two added together and that'll get you your complement. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna write a little formula for you. So tidal volume plus reserve plus complement equals total capacity. Okay, capacity. So then you add all three of these together to get that. Hopefully that made sense. Um, if it didn't make sense, then um, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain it again in the Zoom. Um, and if you've watched the Zoom and you've watched this and it still doesn't make sense, um, I'll need you to, we'll need to hop on Zoom. So email me because I found that my Zoom keeps cutting off if there's inactivity for a certain amount of time. So if you email me though, I can jump on and I can um, try to help you with it. All right, that's all I've got for you today. See you later.